Maybe you can remember from when you were a kid, or now you have children of your own and are constantly reminded there are three things kids love. Sweets, games, and poo. <laughs> and I was no exception. What do you have to eat? Yeah. When you grow up and you look at this video. Little did my dad know that 22 years on, I'd be dedicating a whole talk to poo, <laughs> having researched it at Oxford for my PhD. But most normal adults kind of grow out of this obsession. Not me. I still believe in it. In fact, more than ever. And you might soon too. What if I told you that you could earn £30 for every poo? Ah, oh, you all want to know now. <laughs> or that your poo could even save someone's life. So first of all, let's start with you. You probably think you're 100% human. Or almost. But this is how I see you. So the latest estimate is that only half the cells in our body are human, and the other half are microbial. Most of our body's microbes live in our gut. We call this the gut microbiome and it contains literally trillions of bacteria. In fact, we each have more bacteria in our gut than the number of stars in the Milky Way. And this ratio of human to bacterial cells in our body is thought to be so similar that it might be that before you go to the toilet, you're more bacteria than human, and then afterwards, you're more human than bacteria. <laughs> Although this might not be so true for females, Women are relatively more microbial, gutted. <laughs> um, and this is actually because we have a lower volume of blood. So we basically have fewer human cells in terms of blood cells. And every time we go to the toilet, we excrete roughly a third of the bacterial contents of our large intestine. We grow up thinking poo is something to just flush away as quickly as possible. But what if it isn't so useless after all and could be used for poo transplants? So this is a medical procedure, also known as fecal microbiota transplants, or even better, transpusions. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's basically what it sounds like. So you receive somebody else's poo into your gut, and that can be through a tube from either end, or a pill of poo. Not to be confused with other types of blue pills, or you may end up getting disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely look different from the inside, though. <laughs> and all this might sound like a crazy new idea, but in fact, it's anything but. So historical records show that poo transplants date back to ancient Chinese medicine in the 4th century, where they describe using a fecal suspension to treat digestive diseases but apparently they called it yellow dragon soup so that the patients took it. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of them were convinced, though. <laughs> and at the moment, there's one medical condition that poo transplants or stool transplants, for the slightly more technical term, are proven to treat. And they're only used as a last resort when antibiotics haven't worked. And that is to treat an infection of a really nasty gut bacteria causing diarrhea called Clostridium difficile. And this can be very hard to get rid of, and even fatal. And some patients show dramatic improvement within hours of a stool transplant. And it's actually remarkably effective, as far as medical treatments go. So roughly 90% effective for treating Clostridium difficile. We think that it works, because when the patient receives the transplant, it helps to restore the microbial ecosystem in their gut and to outcompete this infectious bacteria. And because of the success of this treatment, stool banks are now being established. So it's kind of what it sounds like, a bit like blood banks, but instead you freeze filtered poo from healthy donors. And um, in the UK, these stool bank schemes are largely run through hospitals, if you're interested in becoming a donor. But they're now starting to be clinics and organizations established in countries like UK and America that pay around £30 for each donation. Imagine how much you poo. That could pretty much cover your rent. 
But there must be a catch, right? So in some cases, it's harder to become a poo donor than to get into Oxbridge or Harvard. And this is because screening can be rigorous to look for any infectious agents that could be transmitted. And some donation clinics are more stringent and require that donors undergo regular medical checkups. And this is a quote from a doctor who runs a stool bank in Australia. We have a wonderful, squeaky clean toilet here at the stool bank and are always after more premium stool. <laughs> so you may laugh at the idea of premium stool, but this is actually not as wacky as it sounds. So new research is starting to reveal that some of us might have better poo than others, <laughs> given its effectiveness for treating Clostridium difficile. There have since been trials into whether stool transplants may help with inflammatory bowel disease, so conditions like Crohn's and colitis that are also associated with a disrupted gut microbiome. But its success in the treatment of these conditions has proved much more modest. It seems to work for some people, but not others. And one of the factors influencing how effective poo transplants are for inflammatory bowel disease is who the poo comes from. So some people might actually have super poo. <laughs> Could be you. So the best predictor for whether stool transplants are successful for patients with inflammatory bowel disease is the diversity of the donor's gut microbiome. So if the donor has a diverse uh, microbial ecosystem in their gut with lots of different bacterial species, this is more likely to result in successful treatment of the patient. And one of the aims now is to understand what are the key characteristics of a super poo donor? Because if we can understand this, it may one day lead to the development of synthetic stool made from a mix of gut bacteria proven to be effective. And this would also avoid the risk of transmitting unwanted viruses and other pathogens that you get with using an actual stool sample. But we're also starting to realize now that a stool transplant from one donor may work for one person, but not another, depending on the types of bacteria that might be deficient in the patient's gut. So I guess that's kind of venturing into the realms of personalized poo transplants. But what about other conditions beyond the gut? Could stool transplants help with those? So there have been some interesting studies. For example, one involving pairs of human twins, where one twin was obese and one twin was slim. And the researchers colonized the guts of mice with their microbes. And they found that the mice receiving a stool transplant from the obese twin tended to gain weight and lay down fat deposits, but not the mice receiving a stool transplant from the slim twin, even though both mice were, in fact, on an identical diet. Similarly, there's now also evidence that um, mice colonized with gut microbes from people who are depressed show changes in both their physiology and their behavior that's actually characteristic of depression. And animal studies also suggest that the gut microbiome may play a role in other conditions, including diabetes, <coughs> Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and autism. And there have actually been some quite interesting observations where doctors have performed stool transplants for Clostridium difficile and found that it also ameliorated other conditions that their patients had, including depression, chronic fatigue, even arthritis. So following this, there have started being clinical trials looking at whether stool transplants may help with a diverse range of different conditions. And there have been a few promising findings, but it's still in very early days at the moment, so definitely don't try this at home. <laughs> Because as well as any procedural risks, we don't really know everything that's in our poo, right? Even though screening is rigorous, we're still only looking for things we know about. For example, blood transfusions used to be carried out before they knew about screening for HIV. We don't have a comprehensive knowledge of all the biological agents in our stool and their potential to cause disease in recipients. For instance, cancer cells can be shed into stool and there might be conditions linked to gut bacteria that could be transferred. In fact, only last week, a patient in a US trial contracted a fatal infection from antibiotic-resistant bacteria contained within a stool transplant. So it's not without its risks. And also, we don't really know the long-term consequences of having a stool transplant. But it's hard, ethically, 
because some people have an illness that no treatment seems to work for, and then they hear about the microbiome. But science and medical treatment advances based on evidence, both evidence on how well it works and also the risks. With Clostridium difficile, the benefits likely outweigh the risks because it's a very effective treatment and it can be fatal if left untreated. But at the moment, we can't say this for other conditions, at least not yet. And research on the gut microbiome has made a lot of progress, but it's still in its infancy because we're trying to understand this ecosystem in our gut that's just so complex. So just to give you a flavor, these are the chemical reactions going on all the time in one bacterium. And all you have to understand from this image is that it's really complicated. <laughs> and this isn't even all the reactions, it's just the main ones. And then we have hundreds of species of bacteria and different strains within species, and they can all do different things. And then all these bacteria are interacting together. So just imagine a network of interactions, a bit like this, scaled up by trillions. And that's just the bacteria, let alone all the viruses, fungi, and other microscopic organisms making up this ecosystem. And then on top of that, all of these microorganisms and the chemicals they make can influence the immediate environment of our gut and in turn affect our physiology in so many ways. Our immune system, our metabolism, our nervous system, and our hormones. So if bacteria can influence so many different aspects of our health, should we be testing the bacteria we have in our gut? Well, my friend did just that and thought that I'd be a good person to send his results to. Hence this message he wrote in my Leavers book. Dear Kat, we've known each other for seven years and been friends for seven months, but you've analyzed my shit and beaten me at tennis. <laughs> so this was true. He took part in a research study where they looked at his gut flora, like you get a DNA testing kit. Nowadays, there's an increasing number of companies offering a service to the general public where you can send off a stool sample and receive results about the types of bacteria that live in your gut. But do we need to know this? Well, the problem is, apart from maybe a few specific types of bacteria that we know generally aren't nice, and some other types of bacteria that seem to be beneficial, like those with anti-inflammatory properties, we don't really know what a healthy gut microbiome looks like. And one of the reasons that we haven't figured this out is because of the amazing diversity between us in terms of the composition of our gut microbiomes. So if you compared my gut bacteria to yours, we'd probably only have in common about 20% of species. And this graph is just to illustrate the diversity in gut microbiome composition found across people. And it's not even looking at species. There's much broader categories of bacteria where each category is represented by a different color. So it's basically a massive bar chart, and every tiny vertical line is an individual in a healthy population. So these people on the right have lots of bacteria represented by green, and less of the bacteria represented by blue, compared with people on the left. But if rather than looking at the composition of their gut microbiome, we look at the biochemical functions that the bacteria perform in the gut, you get this graph. And this is in the same group of people. So the key thing this shows is that despite this person having such a different composition in their gut microbiome from this person, the function of their gut microbiomes is so similar. It's remarkably conserved across the population. I think that's just so cool. And it goes to show that the types of bacteria living in our gut aren't the whole story. It's also what those bacteria are actually doing. So some of the companies offering personal microbiome testing have now established a big database from all their participants from which they're trying to find robust associations between health conditions and particular microbes. But even then, associations are weak. So it's not possible to confidently say, oh, you have this gut bacteria, so you might get this health condition. But then again, some people are interested to see how their gut microbiome changes if, for example, they have to take antibiotics or they change their diet or lifestyle. And new evidence is emerging that the types of bacteria living in our gut may influence things like how effective medicines are or what types of food we should eat. So it may be helpful to know your gut microbiome in certain contexts in the future. And if the progress in this field continues, some researchers think that your doctor may want to test the microbes in your gut. And we might even have smart toilets 
that take a readout of the composition of our poo and send it straight to our phones. <laughs> so then you might actually have a legit excuse to use your phone when you're on the toilet. <laughs> or smart toilet paper that changes different colours in response to certain microbial chemicals detected in our poo. But I'm not here to say that the gut microbiome is some magic bullet that will be able to treat everything in the future. But I do think that the fact that the gut microbiome is in many ways at the center of our physiology is exciting. It can affect our immune system, our hormones, how we metabolize our food, and our nervous system, including our brain. Hippocrates famously said that all disease stems from the gut. So he may have been onto something. Because our health and well-being is undoubtedly influenced by our gut. Looking after your gut and its microbes is so much more important than I ever realized before I got into this field. And we can do simple things, like eating a healthy and diverse diet that's high in fiber, exercising, not taking antibiotics inappropriately, like if you just have a cold. And also importantly, try not to get too stressed, because stress negatively affects our gut. You feel it, right? and it can actually deplete some of our beneficial gut bacteria. Oh, and one thing people always ask me when I talk about the microbiome is whether they should take probiotics. So these are live bacteria marketed as being good for our health. But in terms of scientific research, the jury is still out regarding their impact on health. So results are mixed. Some research does suggest that probiotics may have beneficial effects in certain circumstances. But there are also now some new findings suggesting that probiotics may even have some negative effects too. For example, they might be able to interfere with immunotherapies, like those used in some cancer treatments. But the one thing that there's uncontroversial evidence in favor of is eating fiber. Your gut bacteria really love all those vegetables. <laughs> so it's not just you that you should be looking after, but also your other half. No, not your partner, they can look after themselves, but your actual other half. Because we have these amazing microbial communities that live in us and on us. And this is you and me and all of us. And that's so cool, right? And it's not scary or something that we should worry about. It's normal that we're all laden with microbes. And as far as we know, every animal on the planet is colonized by microbes, and we are no exception. And I'm sure that we'll continue to learn what these microbes do and how they interact with our bodies. But in the meantime, we also need to acknowledge how many unknowns there are. And I hope that in the years to come, we might find new ways to treat and alleviate diseases and improve health. So hopefully the future is going to be a bit shit. <laughs> so just to end by correcting Madonna, because she got it all wrong. We are living in a microbial world. <laughs> And I am a microbial girl. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>